Oh, hello. Today I actually don't totally know what we're doing together. Also, I'm gonna lower you a little bit here. I don't totally know what we're doing together today because uh, today is my day of rest. I usually try to take one day a week to be totally restful because I find that helps with you know, fatigue management. All my autoimmune baddies out there, you know what I'm talking about. And I stumbled across a title on Goodreads saying that it is Mystery Thriller Week at Goodreads. And when I started looking through the articles that are posted, I was like, I minimally want to react to this and I may want to do a vlog about this. So I don't know. Well, I don't know if I'm filming the beginning of a vlog or if I'm going to post this as a separate reaction. And then if you guys like the idea of a vlog, maybe I'll do one. I don't know. We'll find out. But I just, I grab my camera. We're going to find out what this is together. So I see that there are a hundred mystery thriller recommendations by setting. So I thought we could look at that. And then the one that I'm very intrigued by is the 72 most popular mystery and thrillers of the past three years, which I feel like Goodreads is the right place to tell us what that really is, because I know everybody complains about the Goodreads Choice Awards, which I get it, I agree, but I'm always intrigued by them because while they may not actually measure the best, I do think that they do a decent job at identifying some of the most popular books in given genres. So I'm very intrigued by that. Um, I don't really care about the hottest new authors. A mystery expert recommends queer crime series. Okay, that sounds kind of cool. Uh, ooh, domestic thrillers, y'all know that is not my truth. And then Spring's Most Anticipated Mystery and Thrillers. Okay, so we'll go back up. Let's start with the recommendations by setting. Do to do, do. I don't know if they're doing maintenance right now on Goodreads, but it has been slow AF recently. Okay, so we know I'm obsessed with Isolated Close Circle Mystery, so I'm kind of intrigued to see if they specifically have that. Okay, in a library. I do have the cartographers. Okay, so maybe if I were gonna do a vlog of this, I could pick one from each category and read it. I did love the woman in the library um, and I have the cartographers, so that would be what I would read from that. And then obviously the body in the library, Agatha, all hail. Then we have in a hotel room. I did love the maid. Mm, I don't know. Okay, yeah, the Moonflower Murders I have. And I did read and enjoy the last. Okay, so I mean, I guess I could pick Moonflower Murders if I were gonna do a vlog, that could be my one for there. At the theater, oh my gosh, this is what I needed when I was doing an Instagram Secretly Picks My TBR. I needed this. <laughs> I did really enjoy the appeal. I don't know that any of these other ones are that interesting to me. At the office, All Her Little Secrets was interesting. I don't know that I knew that the other black girl was a mystery, uh, but the escape room, yeah, I definitely have that on my list. Okay, a creepy apartment. Well, I want to like Lucy Foley, but you guys know that I've struggled to like Lucy Foley. <laughs> so that's the only one that stands out on this. At the table, I don't know that those are that appealing. Okay, country house, here we go. This is like my bread and butter. I have read all the top four that are on here. I guess I just don't have that edition marked as red. Uh, Farthing is on my TBR. Okay. Yeah, so I'm thinking that I could definitely build a TBR from this if we decide that's something I want to do. Okay, yeah, because in a locked room, I just read Under Lock and Skeleton Key. I have Malice. I think I physically own Malice. If not, I definitely have that as a, um, it's on my TBR. And then I'd heard good things about Marion Lane and the Midnight Murder. Ooh. Maybe I didn't hear good things. Maybe I was just intrigued because I see the average rating on that one is 3.41. And on Goodreads, that ain't great. So, okay, but I definitely do have one I could pick for that. Oh, and the Hojin murders. I'm surprised I don't have that. I should mark that as one to read. Okay, and then on campus, yes, I have Never Saw Me Coming and In My, Ni In My Dreams I Hold a Knife. I have both of those. I've read The Secret History. <laughs> I recently read The Ma Maidens and that did not go great, but I have two from that. And then At Church, Name of the Rose. Okay, I'm getting into the idea of using this as a basis for, for a TBR, because I think I have in almost every category at least one book I want to read. Oh. Okay, in a very cold place, that is definitely my vibe. I did recently try to read The Overnight Guest, but it made me too sad. It's got harm to children on page and that just like really bums me out. So on planes and trains, 
The ones that I've not read, none of those necessarily stand out to me. On a boat, I definitely have ones on my TBR that are on a boat, but none. Oh, I guess I do have the, the Devil in the Dark Water. So I guess I could read that one, possibly. By the Shore. Beach, the beach setting has never been that intriguing to me. I know some people really like the beach setting because it reminds them of summer and like if it's a beach read kind of situation, they enjoy that. That's never been so much my vibe. And then the Decagon House Murders. Yes, that is one on my list for an island that I could read. I've read the other three, so it feels like I should read that one. Through Time. Yeah, To Say Nothing of the Dog is one I've meant to read. And then The Shining Girls was a big one a few years ago that I was intrigued by. In Space, I loved Six Wakes. I DNF'd Gideon in the ninth. Fugitive Telemetry, yes. Yeah, I've got The Tea Master and the Detective on my TBR. Yeah, okay. So I definitely could do a vlog reading some of these. So we'll put that one as a definite possibility because there was a lot on here that was already on my TBR. So I feel like this one could be a good candidate. Now let's look at the most popular mystery and thrillers of the past three years. We've gathered below 72 of the most popular mystery and thriller books of the past three years as determined by Goodreads members want to read list. Interesting. Let's see. I mean, A, I'm going to be interested to see how many of these I've actually read. Like I'll put at the end, I'll do a count and I'll let you guys know how many of these I've read of the 72. But then let's also pay attention to how many of these I still have been meaning to read versus ones I have no interest in. <laughs> have some books on here that are already on my TBR. I don't know that there was a ton on here that that sparked my interest to read. I think if I were gonna grab one that I don't already have, it would probably be that Thursday Murder Club one. So I don't know. Yeah, I could build a TBR from this. Don't care about the hottest new authors. Okay, yeah, queer crime series. Let's see here. Like a Sister I have on my TBR, but I don't totally understand why it's being spotlighted. Bury Me When I'm Dead, a Charlie Mack Motown mystery in the mid-aughts. Ooh, a PI agency. That's not my vibe, so that's not for me. Uh, let's see here. Harden PI. Is this just like a gay thing? Is this a, a gay trope? Uh, so we've accidentally uncovered um, tropes in Korean author book covers. And apparently queer crime writers only want to write PIs. Yeah, okay, I think this one was kind of a bust because it just seems like there's a lot of PIs on here. So we tried. And then the last one I wanted to look at was Spring's Most Anticipated Thrillers. And this is another one where I kind of at least just want to do like a stat of how many of these I've either read or have on my TBR versus how many I'm not looking into. <laughs> I would say if I were going to do a vlog, I'm most interested in using that one that has all the different places. So I think probably I'll do that. I just realized that I never actually checked in to tell you what the plan of action is. So I decided that I'm going to use the 100 books for different locations list as the generator for my TBR. And to make these recommendations as good as possible, we're gonna go with ones that were already on my TBR. So these are ones that I already had an interest in reading. I think that there were 15, I wanna say in total, that I had on my TBR that were also on the list, and I am picking nine of them. So I think I'm covering eight places, nine books, and all of them are supposed to be different versions of mystery thriller. I think, let's see here, What what is gonna be our criteria for how this goes? <laughs> I guess like, did I like it or not at a very base level? should be the first thing and then the second thing should be was it actually a mystery thriller because like I don't know I feel like sometimes when I'm looking at, at recommendations for that I'm like I don't think that this is actually meaningfully 
a mystery thriller. So I don't know, we'll see. Um, so I guess those will be kind of my two criteria. Did I like it? And is it actually a mystery thriller? So there we go. I don't think I'm gonna show you a lot of like in-between stuff since we already have a long like finding my TBR segment. I think mostly we'll just get straight into the book. So you'll find out when I find out how it goes. Okay guys, we finished the first book and we're not off to a great start because I did not enjoy this. <laughs> so, okay, so the cartographers, the actual rundown for this is that our main character's dad is like a famous map archivist and she studied to follow in his footsteps. And one day she found this map that she thought might be more valuable than it appeared. Like it, it was like a roadside map of New York, but she thought that maybe there was something to it. And he blows up at her and gets her fired, thrown out of the industry that she loves and has trained, like has a PhD in. So it's like trained her whole life to be in and now she can't get a job anywhere. Cut to, I think like seven years later, he is killed at a library and she finds that map that they fought over in his things and mysteriousness ensues from there. This neither really makes sense <laughs> because this ends up also having a speculative element to it. It neither makes sense with the mystery and the speculative element, nor do the character motivations and like plot beats make sense. So it's like, I do, I'm not, it's, and then it's like dull. <laughs> So it's kind of a wacky premise, and I think if it had been funner, I could have just rolled with it and had a good time. But this just, it's like both dull and poorly thought out. But the premise is really cool. So it's a bummer because I definitely think that there's some there there. But for me, it just really did not come together. It would be like if you were reading a Dan Brown book, but the but it wasn't fun. Like you're reading Dan Brown not because any of it really hangs together <laughs> when you think about it for more than a few minutes, but because it's just a good time and you just want to have fun and it's like an action adventure conspiracy type plot and that's what this is trying to be and it's just not fun. So I'm, you know, I wasn't like offended by this. It didn't make me angry. So I'm gonna give it like a one and a half <laughs> for that reason but I think that this is not good and I did not enjoy it. And sadly, this recommendation video is not getting off to a great start. Hopefully the next one we'll do better with. Alrighty, so I finished The Tea Master and the Detective by Aliette de Bodard and it was so good. Um, so it is definitely, I don't think it's quite a whodunit, but like a space opera thriller, I guess might be the genre. Sorry, I'm also distracted because Marple is demanding some pets right now. Let's see if I can get her. Where are you, sweet girl? <gasps> hi. You wanna say hi to the peoples? Yeah? You're such a good girl. Okay, yeah, so it's like a space opera thriller kind of situation. And oh my gosh, I love the writing. I love the vibes. I love the world. I wish the plot had been a little bit better. <laughs> Basically the setup is there are these like mind ships, which I would have liked more information on because I can't tell if they're organic or I, can't, I couldn't quite figure out the situation, but basically it's like you're their birth and then integrated into a spaceship. And there's like a heart room where their core consciousness is, I think. And so we're following a mind ship called the Shadow's Child. And basically this is like a Sherlock Holmes Watson retelling, but the Shadow's Child is the Watson because she was like deeply wounded in this war and her crew was all killed. And then Long Zhao is the Sherlock Holmes figure and she's coming to the Shadow's Child because the Shadow's Child is the titular tea master who like brews these specific teas to like alter consciousness. And Long Zhao is going into deep space and needs consciousness alteringness for that. She's going to recover a corpse for like research purposes. So they go to the shipwreck and they realize that the body that they find on the shipwreck is too new to have been a part of that wreck. 
So my feeling is that that all of that setup was a five star. Like I loved all of it. I love the writing. I've read one other short story or I guess novella from Aliette de Bodard, and I really enjoy her writing and the way she does her settings. They're very evocative. It's lots of vibes, lots of cool ideas. I like the characters. I think the plot, like the mystery thriller aspect of it was not necessarily amazing. I wish that it had been longer. It's a, I would say a long short story or a short novella. And I think it would have benefited from being a short novel because I think the plot just didn't have enough room to breathe when we actually got to the mystery components. But I loved this in terms of what it, the project of it. And I would love more with long, and The Shadow's Child. I would definitely read more with them, so I'll have to do some research and see if there's any other books with them. But very intrigued by this and glad that this pushed me to finally read it because it had been on my TBR for a while. I think that I had it down as an isolated closed circle mystery, which it is not at all. But I think, yeah, definitely a success. This one was really good. <laughs> Okay, so I'm filming my wrap up for the month where I read this book. So I thought I would just go ahead and talk to you guys about it. So Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco. I will say this is one that has been on my TBR for a long time. This is a book that has been recommended to me so many times over the years. And so I'm glad that this finally prompted me to get to it because I'm very happy to report I really enjoyed it. Now, is it a mystery? Th mm, it is. It definitely has a mystery plot. I think if you were looking for a thriller or a mystery, I don't, I would say this is more like literary mystery, literary thriller. So if you are a reader of literary fiction looking to get into mystery thriller, or you're a mystery thriller reader looking to try something a little bit more literary, maybe this would be a good bridging book. But I think if you come into this expecting a thriller or a mystery novel, I'm frankly shocked that this was as big of a bestseller as it was, to be totally honest, because could this be more for Mara? It could not. It is so nerdy. It is all about Christian church history, the 14th century, the Benedictine Franciscan controversy. We got the Avignon papacy. We, I mean, it. it's giving a lot. It's got like obscure, a lost text from Aristotle. We've got, it's very postmodern, which I love. It's like deconstructing a mystery novel. And also the narrator is so sassy. Like I really enjoy, I'd read some Umberto Eco um, critical theory before, but like I don't, had never read read any of his fictions. So this is my first uh, kind of foray into his novels. But you know, he's definitely he's a very postmodern thinker. There's literally a character in here called Jorge of I think Borges, Jorge Luis Borges, anyone. So like it's literally engaging with Borges's stuff. And also there's like this labyrinthine library at the core of this. And I think isn't there a Borges book called The Labyrinth or Labyrinths, something like that. Anyway, it's very meta, which I could not be more about. We got a map. Let me, I really, what I was saying was that I really love his authorial voice. So there's a light framing device here. So there's an introduction from a translator. You guys also know I love a framing device. We'll have another one of those later <laughs> in this reading project. But for example, just like he's so bitchy. I kind of like, there's a lot of like bitchiness in this text. French scholars are notoriously careless about furnishing reliable bibliographic information, but this case was beyond all reasonable pessimism. I just like these little asides. I have eliminated excesses, but I have retained a certain amount. And I fear that I have imitated those bad novelists who, introducing a French character, make him exclaim, parbleu, and la femme, ah, la femme. Like, I don't know. I just, I like his authorial voice. Uh, I like all the metatextual stuff. The way this ends, I think is fascinating. And I'm, I, like I said, I'm shocked this is as big of a hit as it was. I don't think, I mean, yeah, I get why they put it as a mystery thriller. So I guess it is, ish. It's like a very deconstructed, very high art version of one. I I really enjoyed this. I. I think the fact that it does have so many asides in it, as much as I love, you know, some nominalism side talk, I don't know that that lends to it strength as a novel, <laughs> but I enjoyed it. So I may end up bumping up my rating over time for now. I'm gonna give it a four. And yeah, I definitely enjoyed this one. I kind of feel like maybe this should have been the one that was at a library. I definitely liked it more than the cartographer. So I don't know, food for thought. This is very based in a library. So yeah, this one definitely a hit. I would say, yeah, probably my favorite of the three we've read so far. Okay, 
disclaimer on audio guys, I feel like every neighbor I have right now is doing some form of yard work. So I'm sorry if you hear lots of machines. I stayed up late last night to finish Never Saw Me Coming by Vera Kurian. I really enjoyed this. So, okay, I think a lot of people won't like it as much as I did because what I really connected with was the writing and the authorial voice. It says, Never Saw Me Coming as a compulsive voice-driven thriller by an exciting new talent. And I would definitely agree with that. I think it is very voicey. It's very, like you're, if you love this book, you're gonna love it for the writing. So set up here is our, we have basically three main characters we're following, but our kind of main, main character is Chloe. And she has come to this university in a program for studying psychopaths. So she has a full ride and like she has to participate in the study. But the reason she wanted to come to this university is because she is seeking revenge on a guy named Will who wronged her in the past. And we don't quite know what that is at first. So she is in this group. We're also following two other people who are in the group. And then we also get some like random POVs. That was probably a critique I had that maybe cut that down a little bit. But as she is trying to get close to her quarry, two students are murdered who are also in the program. So basically there's a serial killer who is hunting the students in this study program thing at this university. And so it's sort of like, two different lines of action. It's her pursuing her revenge plot, but also serial killer book because somebody's trying to kill all of them. So I really just like this. I had some, I mean, if I'm sitting here with like my objective hat on, I have some critiques about the pacing and the plotting. Um, I think there are some things that could have been tightened up. I, but I just flew, I mean, I stayed up late. I couldn't put this down. And while I, I feel like this is probably a four star. I feel like I should, I have to give it a four and a half because like if it entertains me to the point where I'm like foregoing sleep, you know it's serious because sleep is probably my favorite thing in the entire world. So I think I'd give this a four and a half. It is definitely a thriller, a mystery thriller. It is definitely very entrenched in the college slash university atmosphere. So I think they nailed it on setting. I just really enjoyed this. I like, this is my favorite one we've read so far, which is weird. I feel weird sometimes ranking books like this over books that I know are objectively better. Like The Name of the Rose is objectively a better piece of literature, but I very much subscribe to the Roger Ebert school of reviewing of like, you can't rate the new Fast and Furious movie the same way that you're rating Moonlight. It, like you have to kind of meet the book and the project where it is, and that should be the basis of the rating, at least for me. So for what this is, this is about as good of a, ver I mean, I can imagine some things better, but in terms of entertaining me, which I think is its main end, it did an excellent job of that. So yeah, this is my favorite one so far. Hey, so I am gearing up into my work day, but before I fully, did that, I wanted to check in on the book that I finished last night, which is Farthing by Joe Walton. And I'm really conflicted about how to talk about slash rate this book because it's really good. Quality wise, this is very strong. I think that this is a great example where our own moods and life bring a lot to the table in our reading experiences. This is nothing about the book and just about me and about the state of the world because this is basically about fascism <laughs> and it's an alternative history where instead of fighting Germany in the Second World War, the kind of upper crusty political class of Britain ousted Winston Churchill and came to a peace agreement with the Third Reich. And so all of Europe is the Third Reich and then the British Isles are still separate. So in this alternative history, our main character, Lucy, has married a Jewish man who, by the way, is like rich, just like she's rich, he's rich. And the only thing is just that he's Jewish and there is growing instability in the situation. So like anti-Semitism is on the rise and she has been sort of ousted from her, you know, kind of upper crusty background. She's not really that welcome, but she is at this weekend event with her parents and one of 
of the kind of big players in the political world that her parents run in is murdered. There is a Star of David pinned to his clothing, and it's very clear that her husband is being set up to take the fall for this murder. So she's trying to figure out who done it. There's also a detective who's not going to be deterred from finding the truth just because of political pressure. So he's also, I think his name is Carmichael, that sounds right. He's also on the scene and things kind of progress from there. This is a lot about like disillusionment and what happens when you stop fighting for the things that you believe in. And just given where we are in the world, I wonder if I'd read this in 2014 if I would have like loved this. I think life has happened <laughs> in the last seven to eight years that just makes this really sad and really poignant and, and very impactful, but just not what I was wanting from a country house mystery, <laughs> because it's not very mysterious. Like it's pretty clear what's going on. That And that's not really what the, the book is not. <sighs> It is a mystery. Like it does have a murder mystery plot at the heart of it, but it really is more a political thriller kind of vibe. And that's just not what I want from a country house story. So very good, like very good, but just not meeting me in my moment. So I feel like I'm gonna give this a three and a half star. And I'm gonna say that it's like, yes, it is a mystery thriller, but that's not really the vibe. I guess kind of like The Name of the Rose, but the stakes in The Name of the Rose just felt very different. <laughs> mistakes in this. So very good. Would definitely read something else from this author because the writing was great. This is a good book. I just think wasn't what I was wanting from this kind of book. So anyway, I was gonna read The Decagon Murders next, but I just realized that I thought that I had an ebook of it and I don't. So I'm waiting, but now I like want to read it. So I'm waiting for my copy to show up. So I'm not sure which one I'm gonna read next, but likely won't be The Decagon Murders, will likely be something I already have. <laughs> Alrighty, I finished up The Escape Room by Megan Golden. This is the second book I finished from her and the third book I've started. I started on Stay Awake, but then I just, I got caught up in this project and put it to the side, but I was enjoying what I'd read of that so far. She's a really good writer and I'm just excited to see more and more from her. There are things about this book that really work for me and things about this book that don't. So I'm like between a three and a half and a four. In terms of just page turneriness, which is a lot of what I want from a book like this, this definitely delivered. I was fully engaged, flew through it in one afternoon. I'm filming now from that afternoon. So the setup for this is a bunch of work people get called in to go to this meeting and it ends up being an escape room. None of them, they all have plans, places they're trying to get to, but they have to be there because if they don't, they're wor worried they're gonna get fired. They all work at this sort of high-flying financial firm in New York. And as soon as they get into the escape room, it becomes clear that there is more to it than meets the eye. And the thing that killed this for me, if you know my taste in mystery thriller, you can probably guess what I'm gonna say, is the dual timeline. I actually liked both timelines ultimately, but for the first like 60%, I was really resentful of the past timeline because the actual escape room situation is so tense and interesting. So I just wanted that to be where I was, but I loved the ending, even though I pretty much saw it coming from the jump, I thought it was really well executed. It was really satisfying. And it's the kind of ending that I, really enjoy and I can't tell you more because I don't want to spoil it but if you have read this book and you think about other books that are same kind of thriller this is you will see that this is a thing I enjoy and you will also kind of probably think I'm a, a petty ass bitch which is accurate so anyway I did enjoy this but I think the fact that I was impatient with the other timeline for a good chunk of the book dings it down a little bit so yeah I don't know this was really fun and does just make me ongoingly excited for Megan Golden. I really like the way she puts her thrillers together. I think she has really interesting themes she explores, particularly in The Night Swim. There was a lot, a lot going on in that one. And I don't think this one is as heavy as that, but it does have some of the same thematic concerns. So if you know, you know. And yeah, I mean, I feel like this was a pretty good success and much lighter than farthing because there were no fascists. They were just a bunch of absolutely detestable, you know, Wall Street capitalist assholes who I could enjoy hating. So yeah, there you go. Yeah, I think the next one I'm gonna read is In My Dreams I Hold a Knife, because I'm still waiting for the Decagon murders and Moonflower murders is pretty chonky, so. 
yeah, I think that's what's up next. But yeah, I would definitely call this one a success. Not my favorite, but very, very enjoyable. Okay, well, I have finished Moonflower Murders and I'm between a four and a half and a five on this one. This was awesome. I didn't pick this for my five star predictions list because I felt like it was a cheat knowing how much I liked Magpie Murders, but I would say I like this one a hair more because I liked both the framing device and the novel within a novel pretty equally. So set up for this is we're back with Susan, who is our main character in the first book, who is a former editor and her most popular author was killed in the first book and that's sort of like the inciting incident. Um, but now there is another murder that may be connected to one of his novels and she gets asked basically because there's this woman who is missing and she thought she found the answer to that earlier murder by reading one of his books. And because he's dead and she was the editor, the woman's family comes to her and asks her to come investigate. So she is investigating the disappearance slash the original murder. And then she's also reading the book that was sort of like a take on the original murder at this hotel. So it is definitely squarely set at a hotel. And this time I like both of the stories pretty equally. There was a little part of the Atticus Pund, who is sort of the Hercule Poirot, pastiche that um, inhabits this world, or it, that's always the main character of the book within the book. I thought that there was a little bit of that one that dragged a bit for me, but on the whole, I really liked both of these pretty equally. So yeah, I would say definitely my favorite one I've read so far. So immersive. Absolutely love these. These are just so my thing. So I'm between a four and a half and a five. I probably would say a five, especially when I think about like Magpie Murders and this one. It's definitely five star series for me because it's just, like I said, it's just very much my deal. So this is my favorite one so far. And it's so good, and I knew that I was going to love it, so I'm glad I took the time to enjoy it. Unsurprising. I would definitely say if you are somebody like me who really loves Agatha Christie, not that they are, I wouldn't call them Christie-esque, because I think the Atticus Pooned stories in particular don't necessarily read that much like Christie, but in terms of the kinds of stories, so like the writing doesn't remind me of Agatha Christie, which I think is always going to be sort of the holdup. So I would say in that sense, it's not Christie-esque, but the plots, the characters, the kind of mystery whodunit, the emphasis and focus on the mystery, the fact that it's not really a th domestic thriller ever. Yeah, I don't know. There's just the vibes in general, I think, are very Christie-esque. And I think if you are like me and always on the hunt for that, especially in sort of a more modern author, Magpie Murders and Moonflower Murders definitely hits the spot. And I can't wait. I know there's an adaptation of Magpie Murders. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm sure I will enjoy that as well. So yay, this was a big success. <laughs> friends. So finished In My Dreams I Hold a Knife by Ashley Winstead. And I enjoyed this one. Probably like I'm having a, a kind of a mirrored experience to how I felt about the escape room, which is like, I feel like it's between three and a half and four. And for the escape room, what I enjoyed about it most was the entertainment value. Like I found it pretty entertaining. This is one where I was, it wasn't I was not entertained by it, but I think more what I appreciated about it was the writing quality, which I thought was really nice. And the fact that it was so character driven, which is something I really enjoy in a thriller and you don't always get. Uh, again, the escape room would be a good counterpoint, which is I really like sort of the tension and the page turneriness and the plot of that one versus this. I do. I mean, the plot is fine. So basically, I should say the setup is there was this kind of golden group of friends who all went to this very thinly veiled stand in for Duke called Duquette University. They end up being kind of thrust together their freshman year and they form this sort of very intense kind of like incestuous friend group vibe thing. Very similar to the secret history, but not as 
literary. Like it's not going for as sort of like high a literary tone. So they're all together. And then I think it's their senior year. One of the girls, Heather, is brutally murdered. Her boyfriend is suspected of it, Jack, but they can never really pin it on him. And so it goes unprosecuted, unsolved, whatever. But everyone kind of assumes Jack did it and they all go their separate ways. Our main POV character is Jessica Miller, who is, she was in that group. And she is the only one who has stayed friends with Jack. Um, and she has kind of struggled with a lot of feelings of inadequacy in her life. And so she's going to the 10 year reunion. She has like a lot to prove basically. Somebody wants to adjudicate exactly what it was that happened back then. So a lot of the kind of the old grievances, the old secrets, all of that is coming up at the reunion. So it's a dual timeline. Actually did not mind the dual timeline in this case. I thought it was actually pretty uh, definitely handled. And I believe that if you had told this linearly, it would have been still very entertaining, which is always sort of my litmus test on if I think the dual timeline is covering up for something. Yeah, so like I have a lot of nice things to say about this. I don't know that I emotionally connected with this one as much. And I didn't like love this the way that I know some people did, but especially for a debut, this is incredibly well done. Also shout out to her because at the, in the early pages, she mentions that the local campus coffee shop was the Frothy Monkey. And I'm like, that's a Nashville coffee shop. Is that, I didn't think that they were a franchise. Are they in North Carolina? And I looked it up and they weren't. It turns out I was like, I wonder if she used to live in Nashville. Yes, she went to Vandy. So I appreciated little Nashville Nuggets also used to live in North Carolina. So there was some of that. Uh, so I enjoyed that anyway, side note. All that to say, I liked this. I didn't love it. And I think the problem is that I'm just reading too many of these in a row at this point. <laughs> so um, I am actually going to de-scope the deck of gone house murders because I just, I can feel myself on the, the precipice of a slump because I'm reading too much of one genre. One of my key strategies to avoid slumps is to mix things up in terms of length and type of book and genre, all of that. And I think I just picked a project that was a little too full of one genre. So that's a lesson for me. And I don't wanna read the Decagon House Murders if I'm not in the mood for it because I think it's a book I'm really gonna like. So I don't wanna potentially ruin my experience of it just because my cup overfloweth with mystery thriller right now. So I think we're gonna call it there. Okay, so overall, I'm gonna say that this was a very successful project. So if we're talking about Goodreads picking books that are popular in general, and like that being the basis of their recommendation, I can see why almost all of these are popular. The only one that I didn't quite like, <sighs> was The Cartographers, which is how we started off. And I hated that book. I really did not enjoy it. All the others I gave three and a half or higher. So Cartographers, clearly that's the bottom, right? Like that's, that's the worst one. I'm gonna say the second to worst one is Farthing by Joe Walton, which I still really enjoyed or like really appreciated maybe would be the right word. I just, not in the mood to read about fascism. So I think that's the thing that held me back from loving it. The writing was great and I would absolutely read more from this author. So three and a half. I will also say, okay, if we're talking about did it meet what it was supposed to, the setting it was supposed to have. I think the cartographers, you could probably say yes. This technically, but it didn't really feel like a country house mystery. It felt much more like a, I don't know, political thriller. So technically, but not, not the vibes I would think of for that kind of setting. The Escape Room I also gave three and a half stars to, also very much enjoyed. And this is supposed to be at the office. And I guess it's with workplace friends. It is not at the office though, it's at the Escape Room. But I think in terms of it being incredibly oriented around the workplace, definitely it is. So there's that. And then we hit four star territory already. So the top, yeah, very successful in terms of me liking these. Uh, I'm gonna say In My Dreams I Hold a Knife by Ashley Winstead is gonna be the next one. And yeah, I do definitely, this was meant to be set at a college campus. It definitely is very much centered on college life. So yes, I think this fit the setting and is a thriller. I would say the next one would be The Team Master and the Detective, which is in space. And it, it definitely was very spacey and just delightful. So fun, really enjoyed that one. The Name of the Rose, 
I'll say is my top four star. And yes, I mean, this is at a monastery, so it is in a church, but I think you could equally make the argument that it feels like it's set at a library. So I don't know, but I mean, it's very religiously oriented, so kind of in the same vein as the escape room. Maybe not technically feeling like it's at a church very much, but it's heavily based in religion. So yeah, I think pretty solid there. I'm gonna say my second highest one is Never Saw Me Coming by Vera Curlon. This is also set at a college campus and it was just so fun. I have technical things I could tell you that are not great about this, but I just, this is exactly the feeling I like to have in this kind of thriller, which is like, I just had a great time. So much fun. I was very into the voice. It's very voice driven. I was into the characters, so it didn't matter to me so much if it had like predictable twists or whatever, because that wasn't like what I was reading for. So yeah, I thought this one was super fun. And yes, I would definitely say this is solidly set at a university. Like that is very much the setting. And then I'm gonna say my top one is Moonflower Murders by Anthony Horowitz, which I gave five stars to. And this isn't surprising given how much I enjoyed Magpie Murders, but yeah, I absolutely love this. This is totally very, very basic at a hotel for the framing device, I should say. Well, no, okay, the book within the book also significantly has like a hotel as part of it. So, okay, both, yes, we'll say both. Yeah, this was also great. So, what did we learn? If things are popular, and I already am interested in them, go ahead and read them. I don't know. I don't know that I have a big lesson on this one. Also, can you hear Hastings scratching his little scratchy pad? You such a good boy. Good job. Um, yeah. Anyway, I don't know that I learned a lot from this, but I definitely had fun doing it. Let me know if any of the books I talked about were interesting to you, or if you have any interest in me revisiting some of those other lists that I was looking at. And yeah, I think that will do it for me. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social meds if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below, and I think that that will do it. I hope you're having an absolutely lovely day today, and I will just talk to you soon. Bye!